Do you remember last year when you set up your New Year's resolutions? For many people, it sort of ends on January 2nd. But why is that? What are those blocks that people experience? Why is it so difficult to adhere to that new gym program or new diet? Why is it difficult to sometimes do that thing you need to do to get a promotion at work or to move ahead in life? Oftentimes, it's something called incongruence. What do I mean by that? What I'm talking about here is an incongruence between the emotional part of the brain and the logical knowing part of the brain. So in your logical, the neocortex of the brain, you might be thinking, I would like to do this. I would like to achieve this. But in the emotional brain, there's some block from preventing it from happening. So what causes this incongruence in the brain? Oftentimes, it's previous life experiences that get in our way. Previous life experiences that get encoded in the emotional part of the brain. And then when we encounter something in present day that's in any way a reminder of those earlier experiences, it sets off an immediate set of thoughts, reactions, and behaviors. And before we know it, we're doing something other than what our logical brain would like us to be doing. Now, there's extreme examples of this incongruence, like for example, in post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Think of an Iraqi war vet who was maybe on the bomb squad and had to immediately take cover, get into a protective mode whenever he heard a loud noise because that could mean an explosive was going off. Now he's back, back in his hometown in central Pennsylvania, and walking down the street, a car backfires, immediately takes cover before he can even think about it because the emotional part of the brain has learned a set of behaviors or reactions to an outside cue. In a smaller, more subtler way, that's happening all the time where we are reacting to and responding to cues in the environment based upon previous experiences in a way that's outside of our conscious control. For example, I've worked with large groups of cancer patients, and in fact, we've published clinical trials on this very phenomena in that group of people. So they may have had a traumatic experience related to their cancer diagnosis. It may have actually been the moment of diagnosis and the thought of the world is, is ending. What do I do? What happens to my kids? All of these things where life feels threatened in a way. When they get that yearly notification, say for the mammogram, for a breast cancer survivor, there's this immediate reaction that occurs. And with that, a set of behaviors that may not even be in the person's awareness, such as avoiding that cue by putting that reminder in a drawer and not looking at it again, which might mean she doesn't actually get the mammogram that she needs for her follow-up, which means lots of other things because her whole nervous system just reacted in a way that isn't that healthy, that puts her into fight or flight mode when it's not necessary because the fight has already been fought. There is no fight, but the body doesn't know that. The brain doesn't know that. It sees the reminder of the cue of this event that's unresolved in some way in the emotional part of the brain and she goes into a certain kind of a mode that isn't optimal for her overall health and well-being. So congruence can mean different things. In its simplest definition, it's agreement. There's some agreement between the emotional part of the brain and the logical neocortical part of the brain. They sit in different areas and they're in constant communication, but sometimes they're in agreement, sometimes they're not in agreement. When they're not in agreement, the emotional brain often wins because those emotional memories are linked to survival in some way. Oftentimes, these types of experiences that I'm talking about, there was a threat to well-being. There was a way that the person coped with that threat to well-being, and that's the automatic coping they go into when there's any kind of a reminder in the environment. And it may be a reminder that they're aware of or a cue that they, that they notice, like something overt, the reminder to go get the mammogram, or it might be something that is completely out of their awareness, but yet the emotional part of the brain registers it and puts the person into a certain mode, which is why 
we're often reacting to things and we don't even know that we are or why we are. But the problem is with these experiences is there hasn't been an efficient way to honing in on which experience is causing the issue or the, or the problematic behavior and also how do you reconcile it? Because sometimes even if you do hone in on what it's about, talking about it isn't enough. Before I reveal to you what we've discovered as a highly effective way of addressing these types of issues, I wanna show you a real live example of somebody that I worked with at a seminar. I didn't know this lady, but I asked for a volunteer really just to demonstrate the congruence in the brain when we're emotionally feeling one way, but logically or in our neocortical brain thinking another way. This happened to be a conference on plastic surgery. I was asked to give a talk about some of the emotional and psychological aspects of getting plastic surgery. And so I wanted to really underscore this congruence incongruence issue because if a patient's not congruent with the way they look and with the procedure they wanna have, they're not gonna be a happy patient post-op. And so we happen to have in the audience a very skilled advanced practice nurse who is contemplating getting a procedure herself, as you'll see, and had some concerns about whether or not she was really feeling congruent with it and what the path forward would look like. Deborah, let's start with why you came up here. Are you thinking about having something done or? Um, I'm ha actually, I'm in the process of having something done. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Are you um, willing to share what that is? Sure. Sure, I'm having um, corrections for spider veins. I have pretty ex extensive spider veins. Yes. I spent 35 years working as a nurse on concrete floors. Yep. It bothered me, you know, the way that they looked. Um, but as time went on, I, I kind of just really looked at that. It really wasn't important. I stopped caring about it. It really didn't bother me at all. But then people started to comment, like if I wore a skirt or a dress or a pair of shorts. A child said one time to their mother at a public event, what happened to that lady? She looks like she had a car accident or fell down or something, the child said. And I thought that bothered me. So in this technique, one of the things you'll see me do is applying pressure to the arm and she resists against it. What I'm doing is a form of muscle biofeedback. So let's just start with, I'm okay with my legs. Say I'm that okay with my legs. Hold. That feels congruent. I'm okay with the way my legs look. I'm okay with the way my legs look. And see, there we have that <laughs> inhibition, right? Again, I want to remind everybody that the difference between preference and incongruence is you might not prefer, you know, the veins or whatever, but that incongruence in the limbic part of the brain means it's causing too much distress. And so we don't want incongruence. Like we want you to be okay, no matter what your legs look like, even if you would prefer them to look differently. Does that make sense to you? And does that make mm -hmm. sense to everybody else? We want her to be okay internally even if she might have a cognitive appraisal that says, oh, but you know, I might like them to look a little bit differently. We're able to get a sense of congruence or incongruence in the body by measuring the autonomic nervous system's response to what we're talking about. This is actually the basis of the polygraph. So if you've ever seen a polygraph where the lines go way up and down when somebody says something that they know is untrue, it's the autonomic nervous system reacting to something that's incongruent to what the person knows. In the same way, we use the muscle test without having all of the biofeedback or polygraph equipment to be a crude guide of congruence or incongruence as because we're measuring the autonomic nervous system's muscle feedback response. So there's a relative strength or weakness based upon whether or not there's an agreement with the statement in her brain or a disagreement. So an agreement, a disagreement. So, hold. I'm okay with the way my legs look. Say that again for I'm me. I'm okay with the way my legs look. And if look. you could keep repeating that, I'm going to do these acupuncture pulse points until I find the right one. I'm okay with the way my legs look. 
keep going. I'm okay with the way my legs look. Okay, hold. And so what I have is kidney bladder meridian. So I'm going to, now that we kind of have this incongruence, see which of these descriptors of that meridian keep the incongruence going. So hold strong. So there's fear, hold strong. And so that immediately just goes right in there. And you know, that's not the emotion I would have expected, but I always just follow the flow. Why might there be sort of fear about the way they look? I think the fear came when there was a bleed. Mm -hmm. I was hiking or something. I can't remember what I was doing, but uh, I got a puncture wound over one of them and it bled for hours. Mm -hmm. And can you think about the fear you had with that bleed? Mm -hmm. Hold, keep thinking about it, hold. Okay, and that counters it nice and strong. So what I'd like you to do is I'm gonna have you bring your index finger around here, time collapse. And I want you to go to that moment where you were in that state of fear over the bleed and breathe it in and out. Breathe through that experience as if it were happening right now and just keep doing that till it shifts or change. Might take a few seconds, might even take up to a couple minutes. Just breathing it in and out. So let's just see if there's anything else around this in terms of the congruence. I'm okay with the way my legs look. I'm okay with the way my legs look. So we're, we got some more going on. So let's see what that's about. Keep holding strong and keep saying that for me. I'm okay with the way my legs look. Hold, you're I'm doing okay great. I'm okay with the way things. my legs look. I'm okay, okay. with the way my so legs look. Okay, so now I've got look. conception governing vessel. And so I know that this one has a flavor of emotion that's a little more unpleasant because these are sort of the shame-based emotions. Okay. Let's that's hone in onto that. Exactly. Okay. So the concept that you'd be embarrassed at somebody sort of making yeah, a... Yeah, but I a, made them uncomfortable. Like the kid went, oh, what happened to that lady's leg? Yeah, go to that. Yeah, go to that the child uncomfortable. See that? There we go. Yeah, see that? Right. Yeah. So the concept that... The <laughs> Sorry, concept, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see that big thing? Yeah. That, you know... Okay. That, can you go to that moment where he made you so... Where you... Yes, yeah, I felt that, bad for him. I wanted to go talk to him. But yeah. also how you um, felt about yourself is important, not um, just him. Yeah, there, you was gotta go there was a vulnerability there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Can you see that vulnerability? Yes. yes. And can mm -hmm. you see the mm -hmm. sort of sense of embarrassment with the vulnerability? Mm, yes. Okay, yes. there we are. Mm -hmm. And hold index finger here where my finger is. Yeah. Hold. Right there. Yes, hand across your forehead. Okay. And then relax. Mm -hmm. And let's let time collapse as if you're right there in front of that kid. Nice deep breaths. Really connecting to that shameful, embarrassing, whatever, what, however you would describe it feeling. And not just how you made him feel, but that was important, but how that made you feel about yourself. Nice deep breaths. And just stay with it for as long as you need till it shifts. Here's the thing about integrative health. We use a lot of modalities. We try to put together what makes sense to add value to whatever's happening with that patient's care, and also to move the needle forward. So in the case of the neuroemotional technique, there's a combination of things going on. Everything from basic cognitive psychology to traditional Chinese medicine. We use the acupressure pulse points as a guide of the different emotions that are coming up for that person in the emotional part of the brain. And in the healing component of NET, or neuroemotional technique, we engage those pulse points so that what we have going on at the same time is a communication between the emotional and logical part of the brain, the energetic circuits in the body that are involved with that, according to the traditional Chinese medicine system, and also the thoughts that somebody's thinking and the feelings that they're having, all as they're taking nice deep breaths and allowing the conversation to correct itself in a way. Good. <laughs> that was nice. I'm okay with the way my legs look. I'm okay with the way my legs look. Oh, and now it's nice and strong. I like that. Yeah. And I'm okay having the procedure. What are you having done? Um, uh, what, what? Saline solution with a vascular surgeon is doing it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is it called, though? I can't remember. Um, what you it's not that. ablation. It's called. It's um, not. A, it's not scler sclerotherapy. I okay. It's yeah. Sclerotherapy. All right. I'm okay with having the sclerotherapy. I'm okay with having sclerotherapy. Yeah. And see, now mm -hmm. we're Congress with what is. I'm okay if I choose not to have it. I'm okay if I choose not to have it. Yeah. I'm okay with my legs looking the way that they look. 
I'm okay with my legs looking the way that they and look. And see, the hesitation was you prefer to have them done now, yeah, right? Because you would prefer too. them to be different, but you're no longer in that incongruent state yeah. where there's all this emotion fueling it. Now it's, yeah, I'd like to have them done. Yeah, I'd like to look better. You yeah. don't mind that at all. Yeah. Right. But mm. where you are emotionally mm. is... It's good. It's good. I can take it one way, take it or leave it, really. And yeah. I did not prepay her for the demonstration. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> We've never met before. Thank no. you so much, Thank Deborah, you. for coming Thank up for that. Thank you. Because we saw such amazing results with NET, we decided to really rigorously study it. And as I mentioned earlier, we did that with cancer survivors. And one of the things we did was functional MRI imaging of the traumatic event pre and post NET. And let me tell you, the results were amazing. We've published in the top journal for cancer survivorship. And as you can see, pre NET, this is the emotional part of the brain that's lit up. When the person is hearing a script of that distressing event, the brain is on fire. And when that's the case, we know from our follow-up studies of connectivity that this is creating autonomic nervous system arousal. And so when that occurs, that affects health outcomes all the way across the board. And we also know that it's increasing distress levels. Here's what we see post NET when they're listening to that same script, all of a sudden that activation isn't there. Then on top of that, if we take a look at these, we can see that the communication pathways in the brain have changed markedly. So brain physiology is significantly changed after something like NET. It isn't just what we notice in the muscle test, which understandably might look a little bit odd for the first time, but the results in the fMRI, those are pretty undeniable. And then the subjective psychometrics that we got from people, how does their mood change? How does their perception of the event change? So let's take that back to the New Year's resolutions that you might be struggling to achieve. It very well might be that there are some experiences in your life that get in the way of you reaching that goal. And that's the great thing about NET. It can zero right in on what that's about and often resolve things in a highly efficient way. That's what I love about the intervention, and that's why I've become such a proponent of it over the years. This treatment experience almost looks magical, but it really isn't. When we break it down, there's a physiological explanation for what it's occurring, and there's also an energetic explanation for what's occurring. What it requires is an open-mindedness to bring together what we know in the Western medical system with traditional Chinese medicine, because the two are really at work in an intervention like this. So then in the correction, it looks complicated, but it all makes sense once there's a basic foundational understanding of what's going on in this intervention. It gets the emotional brain and the logical brain on the computer screen at the same time and opens up the communication that's been shut off. Because what happens when there's incongruence is the emotional brain gets activated and it takes over. And so, the logical neocortical brain can't really weigh in at an equal level. Now it can. That's what we're facilitating with that, with that corrective experience. And so that's why I tell her, keep breathing until you notice a shift in some way. That shift can be anything. They can notice that it feels lighter. They can have an aha moment. I don't try to tell them what it's going to be, but oftentimes I hear lots of really unique, cool things in, in, at the end of that breathing. Well, I had put my head down and, um, and I, you know, he, he instructed me to, he said, you know, um, keep your hand on your, um, on your forehead and put your head down and breathe deeply. So I had my head down and I, I you know, I was just um, really kind of not, no thought. My mind was just kind of empty. You know, and I didn't have any intention of what, I, what was going to happen to me. And um, all of a sudden I thought, oh, I, have, oh, I, think I, I think I really just needed to have some good deep breaths because, wow, I mean, I just really feel really good from this, well, this is a deep breath. Then when I picked my head up, I realized it had nothing to do with breathing. All of a sudden I felt um, almost playful, like kind of joyful. I felt this like joy. It was, uh, it's the only way I could describe it. It was proof positive when he brought up the topic of fear. 
that when you push my arm, my arm just went down. And I, you know, it was like, it, it was almost like a loss. I had this, oh, I'm not controlling this. I'm not controlling my arm right now. And I thought I was, he told me to resist it. And, you know, therefore I had control of my arm if I'm resisting it. And I was resisting it, but I had no control of my arm. What he brought up was, oh, so there's fear there. Fear of what? I have to think, hmm, what do I really want to say? There's other people listening, and I don't realize this is getting a little more personal than I had anticipated. Okay, so I might as well just tell the truth here, or I'm just going to tell the truth. You know, that as a child, you know, and I said some things about my childhood experience in terms of looking at um, abnormalities, on pe abnormal things on people, you know, scars and cuts and things like this. And then, you know, the fear of bleeding to death from it uh, came up. So he, he, he nailed me on that. He was like, it was unavoidable. So you couldn't avoid it. There was no more like, yeah, you know, I used to be afraid of this, but you know, I'm not so afraid of it anymore. You know, yeah, I'm good with it. <laughs> I'm fine with it. You couldn't do that. I said, yes, it, yes, it's fear. And from there, then it, then it could get right. Then it could come out. It could come up. Then it came, then it, the, the, then it came forward is what happened. The experience of it was the fear got connected with the release of the fear. <laughs> I don't really, I don't know really, that's what happened, but I'm not exactly sure. There's a part of my mind that just doesn't follow that scientifically because I don't understand it. So sometimes, you know, you have to believe what you can't actually see because you see the manifestation of it as real, as real. even though you may not uh, see the rationale in it or the science in it, because you can't see that. You know, maybe he could see that. He studied acupunctures and Chinese medicine. I haven't, so, but I believe it. It's so, it was really powerful, really effective.